Welcome to this video series. I am Tim Janisewski, the Director of Spotlight Good News Ministries. We're so glad to have you joining us for this five-part program. And before we dive into the subject matter of the program, let me simply l make known to you the purpose for Spotlight Good News Ministries. It has three components to it. The first component is that we want you to be growing in your faith story. We spotlight stories because we think you have a story of faith that God is writing with you through Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. And if you don't have that kind of a faith story, it is God's great desire that you have opportunity to come into a relationship with him through Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit and begin to write that story, that faith story, to spotlight your story each and every day through the power, the grace, and the mercy, and the love of God. Well, secondly, at Spotlight, we want to put a spotlight on service. Jesus said that he came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's Mark 10, 45. If there's anyone who ever walked the face of the earth who should have been served, and did not need to serve, it would have been Jesus Christ. And yet, quite to the contrary, quite the opposite, he came for the very purpose of serving and not being served. So, if we are walking with Christ, journeying daily with him, then indeed we would be his followers. We would imitate him, and we cannot truly imitate him and imitate him well unless we too are living a life of service. So we spotlight service in the lives of people to encourage you to live a life of service to the glory of God. And thirdly, we come to the purpose for this series. We spotlight scripture. Why do we do that? Well, we believe that the scriptures are foundational to a vital Christian experience. We only can spotlight a healthy Christian story when we find that we have spotlighted scripture, which is the substructure or the foundation to that vital Christian story, your Christian story. And the same is true of our service. Our service will only flourish and produce great fruit and joy for us and others if it is grounded and founded upon an understanding of Scripture, knowing what we believe, why we believe, and how what we believe and why we believe it applies to our everyday life of service. And that's why we do these series here at Spotlight. There are any number of them that you can find at our website, spotlightgoodnews.com. Some of them have to do with encouraging your daily devotional life. Others of them simply give another overview of Christian theology. Again, what we believe, why we believe, and how we live out those beliefs. And still others might be used for uh, small groups or life groups in your local church. All of these are available to you, and in this particular series, we simply add to it. A quote that has long been a favorite of mine is by Johann Albrecht Bengel. He was a Lutheran pastor and theologian who lived back in the 18th century. And in 1734, he wrote these words. Apply yourself totally to the text of Scripture, and apply the text of Scripture totally to your life. That's a great word of encouragement to us. On the one hand, we are to exert energy and diligence. We are to focus upon with all of our ability, all our helps, all our resources, the text of the scripture. We are to ask, what does the word of God say to us? And we want to mine it in all its height and depth and breadth. And yet that's not enough. If all we have done is applied ourselves totally to the text of scripture, but we have then not allowed, if you will, the boomerang to turn around and come back and applied the text of Scripture totally to our lives, then we've only done half of the job. And indeed, the second half is perhaps more important than even the first half. God gave us his word. He gave us the Scripture so that we would know and understand it, yes, but more so that it would shine the light of God's revelation into our minds, into our hearts, into our wills and our volition, and into our everyday experience. And so that is what we intend to do here through this current series. So let's get to the series. What is it? It's entitled Jesus Agenda for the Church, and it will be based upon 
Matthew chapter 4, verses 12 through 25. As always at Spotlight, we ask the why question. Why devote some time to this particular series? You're probably a busy person, and there are a million and one other resources from which you could choose to uh, set aside and allot your precious time. What might make this one worth your while? Well, I think it's worthwhile because the church is worthwhile. I think it's worthwhile because Jesus is worthwhile. He's always worthwhile. And his agenda is worthwhile. If Jesus has an agenda, and that agenda is to impact the life of the local church, then we should pay attention and be interested in Jesus' agenda for the local church. And I also say this because I think that the church is important based on Jesus' testimony himself. If we were to pick up and read from Matthew chapter 16, we would see a very important episode, an encounter between Jesus and Simon Peter. And in it, Jesus says, who do people say that I am? And the disciples respond. Some say you're a prophet. Some say you're Elijah. Come again. Some say this. Some say that. There are lots of rumors out there about who Jesus is. Then, of course, Jesus says, yes, but who do you say that I am? And then Peter speaks up and says the words that are of such great significance. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You are the Christ, the Messiah of God, the Son of the living God. And Jesus' response is immediate. He says, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, because flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. You didn't just make this up on your own. You just didn't come up with it because you're such a smart and insightful sort of person, Peter. No. Now your flesh and blood didn't come up with this. Now, this was the work of God's Spirit speaking into the life of Peter about who Jesus is and what Jesus came to do. And then Jesus significantly says, upon this rock, and we believe that's the confession of Peter, not Peter himself. Our Catholic friends would say it's Peter himself, but we would say it's the confession of Peter. Upon the rock of Peter's confession, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Upon that I will, do not miss this, build my church. I will build my church. Very important, Jesus says, I intend to build a church, and that church's cornerstone will be nothing less than me and your profession and faithful confession of me and my identity. And Jesus goes on famously, of course, to continue and say, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That's a promise from Jesus. The gates of hell will not ultimately prevail against his church. And Jesus doesn't break his promise. Hasn't broken one yet? I think you can depend upon the fact that he will not break one in the future or break one ever. His promise is, that he is going to build his church. So the church must be significant if Jesus gives his word that he will build it. And then he reinforces that with the negative. The gates of hell, hell itself, Satan itself, the evil one, the powers of darkness will not overcome, will not defeat his church. This is, of course, not to say that the church will always do splendidly well and shine brilliantly and beautifully. Well, we know better than that, don't we? And what it means is that, yes, the church will be buffeted, and to be sure, it will be bruised. It will be embattled, even divided within itself on occasion. But even in the midst of all of that, Jesus says, you can count on my word that I will not allow my church to perish and the gates of hell will not prevail. Quite to the contrary, when all is said, when all is done, when the smoke clears, when Jesus appears in glory to judge the living and the dead, the blessed hope of the church will be fulfilled and the church will be perfected as the very bride of Christ in the new heavens and the new earth. I hope you're getting a sense of why the church is so important. It's been frequently said that the church is God's plan A. The church is Christ's plan A. Well, what's his plan B? The answer is there ain't no plan B. There's only a plan A and plan A is the church of Jesus Christ and its members, including you and me. 
if you will, God is betting the farm on his church and he's putting the full weight of the authority of his son upon the church as his means of expanding his kingdom, his means of having the word of salvation declared. That salvation will be declared to every people, every tribe, every tongue, every nation, every people group, the face of the earth. That is our calling and that is our commission from Jesus Christ. That is the plan A. And though we may not fulfill that plan A well all the time, it is still God's plan and Christ's plan. And if it's his plan A, then we need to indeed want the church to be as healthy as possible, as impactful as it can possibly be, as vital as it can be, as faithful as it can be, and as vibrant as it can be. That's the call that we should desire in the church. You know, and I say that because I think the church has been marginalized in our culture. If you'd asked our culture a hundred years ago, whether it valued what the church said, what the leaders of the church would comment on an issue, people would stop and listen to the pastor or to church leaders and organizations. The church was valued as a, a clarion voice for truth and reason and faith within the culture. Well, I think if we just take a quick, quick look around, we will see that that no longer is the case. In fact, oftentimes if the church says it, it is to be ignored or ridiculed among the elite of our culture today. So hard times have come to the church, perhaps more difficult than ever before here in the United States, which is but another reason that we need to think about the church and we need to refocus again on what Jesus' agenda would be for the church in the times in which we now find ourselves. And we need to do it because sometimes the church deserves to be marginalized. We say bonehead things, do bonehead things, stir up difficulties and problems that do not further the kingdom of God and honor Christ. But we have to also be willing to take our stand and dig in faithfully, knowing that the culture will always see us as a nuisance when we truly represent Christ. We are a Christian counterculture. And to be a counterculture means that sometimes the culture will object to us. So we, we do nevertheless need to ask the question, is the opposition or is the marginalization coming from our own mistaken doing or because of fidelity and faithfulness, because we are living out Jesus' agenda for his church? Well, let's stop and ask ourselves to complete this first session. Did Jesus actually have an agenda for his own ministry and his own mission? Did he have an agenda? I think if I were to ask myself that question years ago when I was a young Christian, I probably would have answered by saying, I don't really know. Uh, I never thought about it. It wasn't really a pressing question in my mind. And if I did think any more deeply than that, I think my response would have been, uh, I'm not sure Jesus needs an agenda or a, an action plan or a ministry strategy because Jesus was perfectly led by the Holy Spirit. He says in the Gospel of John that he sees what the Father is doing and does the Father's will. He hears from the Father by the Spirit and obeys perfectly. And I think I would have stopped and said if, if Jesus was the perfect Spirit-filled man, God-man who constantly walked in faithfulness to the guidance and direction of the Lord, his heavenly Father. Oh, why do you need an action plan? Why do you need uh, an agenda? Why do you need to have some kind of formulation and framework for doing your ministry? And I would have probably left it at that. But I do think that, yes, that is true of Jesus, but nevertheless, he works within the framework of an agenda and a ministry plan. He is following the guidance of the Spirit because of a structure that he has arranged for that ministry and that mission. And his being led by the Spirit flourishes. His working the works of the Father are amplified because of his intentionality about what he's doing, why he's doing it, with whom and to whom he is doing it, and with what sort of outcome he is doing it. 
So what we're going to do is look at Matthew chapter 4 verses 12 through 25 where I suggest to you there is a fourfold agenda for Jesus' ministry. And that fourfold agenda not only applied to his three years in Galilee in the north when he was proclaiming the kingdom of heaven, it applies to each and every local church today. And as local churches apply Jesus' ministry agenda, we will flourish. And individually, in your own life, as you take and apply this fourfold agenda to your personal daily walk of faith, you will see yourself thriving and flourishing more deeply as a follower of Jesus Christ. So what's that fourfold event agenda? Well, we're going to get to that in our next session together as we will be reading from Matthew chapter 4, verses 12 through 25. So that's our subject matter, Jesus' agenda for the church. Come along for the ride with us. And if this is edifying to you, please like us and share us with other people. Get out the good word that we want to help your church and you to grow in faith through Jesus' agenda for the church. If you want to be in touch with me or respond, interact, would love for you to do that. You can do so through info at spotlightgoodnews.com. That's info at spotlightgoodnews.com. Once again, I'm Tim Janisewski, and we will talk to you next time.